Um, and this week, we will finally move on to the third um, of serve. Here I am, Lord, send me. So if you recall, we had already done the first two sessions and then COVID-19 uh, arrived in our community and changed the way we all have worshiped for the past several weeks. We feel this information is really important. Uh, and I think that it will be uh, a great sense of value to you and help you in your spiritual journey and your walk. And uh, so we want to continue that study uh, by continuing this. So whether you're watching this on Wednesday night or you're watching it on Thursday morning or whenever else you are, um, I hope that you get the same benefit of the content, even though we're not able to do this together. So interestingly, when you look at the Bible and you do a little bit of a study, the words of serve, serving, service, or servant in some form or fashion, that root appears more than a thousand times in the Bible. And clearly we know that worshiping is an important mode of working in the world is by working through people. And the work to embody God's love and justice to heal the world and to help others is really what we're called to do. You know, very early in the Bible in Genesis 6, we read that the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. You know, the evil that had been seen and done is what left God's heart heartbroken. Um, and he goes on, and we, as we go through the Old Testament, we see that God really wants more than just us attending church. He really wants more than us having a, a good prayer life. He wants more than us reading the Bible. He wants more of us to just avoid doing evil. Um, and that those together sound like a pretty call, a pretty big call. Um, but what he really wants is, is something different. And when you think about it, all of those things, the attending church, praying, reading the Bible, avoiding doing evil, those are all things that we control. They're internal to the individual. What he wants us to do is to also do good and to practice justice and kindness and love. We see this start in Isaiah in 11, starting in verse 11, where it says, The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and of the, fattened, of the fat of the fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to me to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and conv convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. And then in Micah 6, and we read, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We get a little bit more direction in Proverbs, where it says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and of the needy. See, when we start to examine scripture, we really realize that it's impossible for us to be the type of Christ follower that Jesus longs for without having concern for justice and mercy and to take care of the vulnerable and the weak and the marginalized and the poor. We even see this very clearly in the words of Jesus in Matthew. And he says that essentially we'll, we will be judged on how we care for other people. But very commonly, we hear the phrase of, you know, as you gave, as you gave clothing or as you gave a, cold, a cup of cold water, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Paul tells us in Romans that, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
and we get an answer to what does God want and, and what does he not want uh, here in Romans when Paul says your body, your whole life should be a sacrifice. And that's really the root of what we're talking about today is serving. And, and how do we do that? And what does that look like? You know, oftentimes we think of serving and we serve together. And really that's part of the roots of Methodism. Um, Methodists, when you look at this, have created a, a many schools, many medical clinics, orphanages, many different feeding ministries and training programs. One of the... Uh, one of the things that Methodism was really formed to do was to really sort of take care of some of these gaps and for about it, we can accomplish much together as we're working together. You know, I think about some of the impacts that just as the United Methodist Church has um, in our apportionments and how they go to do major projects across the entire world. You know, we help fund missionaries that live in other countries. Um, you think about the work that we have done with malaria and prevention of that. Um, and even prevention and care of females in, in foreign countries that are just being ravaged by war. All of those are things that we could do together um, by everybody putting in a little bit um, that we would never be able to do probably on an individual basis, but we can have huge impact. And all of that is part of this serving together. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state but rather the conscience of the saint. And when you think about that, one of the other things that we come into here is that we really have a responsibility to speak up and to vote to our contentions. So it is um, interesting on the timing of this, because you think about this, this was several weeks ago when we would have originally had this. But um, just this statement by Dr. King made me just sort of pause for just a moment and go, you know, oftentimes we get stuck in this, the division of church and state, but uh, Dr. King would even tell us that we've got a different call, and our call is to be the conscience of the state, not the master nor the servant. You know, when we look at the commandments from Jesus, uh, two of the greatest commandments from Jesus are about love, to love your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And what we what we come to learn is that love is really not a, it's not a feeling. It's really a way of living and it's a way of being. Now that verse that we read in Micah, Micah 6, 8, tells us to, uh, to do justice and to love kindness. But what we really realize when we look at this is that when, when you talk about doing justice and loving kindness and practicing love, all of those are intertwined. Um, and although my arrows sort of point like this, there, there's, there's a lot of those that are all together. You know, when you practice kindness, it's really an expression of love um, and of justice. All of those are mixed in together. You know, hesed is the Hebrew word that we translate as kindness. And it appears more than 240 times in the Hebrew Bible um, and often can be translated as mercy or steadfast or covenant love. It's, it's often described God's love for humanity, but can also describe an act of goodness that is unexpected. If you think about it, one of the ways that we describe grace oftenly is undeserved kindness. You know, this grace is really essential to Christian belief. We believe that we're saved through grace, not through our works, and that Jesus' life and death embody grace. Adam says in the book that if there was an attribute of an attribute of Christ that we're meant to emulate, it would be this kind of undeserved kindness and love shared with other people. You know, kindness really isn't hard. It's not a hard thing, but it does require us to be very intentional and it sometimes can require some determination and it actually takes a little bit of practice. You know, during our prayers, one of the things that uh, we learned last week is that one of Adam's prayers is that he often says, here I am, Lord, send me, use me. Let me be the one that does the work for you. The flip side of that is then we have to pay attention. We have to pay attention to what's going on around us, and we have to listen for God's prompting. You know, one of the, one of the examples that we see about this is early in the gospel, when you read the gospel of Luke. 
and we, we hear about the angel Gabriel coming to the Virgin Mary and telling her all that's going to happen. And her response, although, you know, originally she's scared and she's frightened, she doesn't know what's going to happen, but her response is really, here I am. Use me. Lord, I'm your servant. I will do everything that you ask of me. So just take a second and just think about it. What would the impact be if we prayed that every morning? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. Let me fulfill your will today. Many of you are familiar with this, but the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer puts a lot of this into perspective for us. It, it says, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. we see here in this prayer is really servant. It's a servant attitude. It's, it is literally, it does not matter what happens to me. I will do everything that you ask, no matter where that puts me. It's interesting that even when you read some of the gospel stories, one of the, one of the stories that we see is that the disciples even argued about this. Um, you know, they argued with who would be the greatest, who was going to sit at the right hand and who was going to sit at the left hand. And Jesus tells them very plainly that the last will be first. And then he demonstrates that during the Last Supper. So we're familiar with that. He, he, you know, he, wraps his, he wraps himself in towel and he washes the disciples' feet. And some of them have got, you know, there's, there's no reason that this should be happening like this, but it does. Um, and he performs this, this miraculous act of servitude to them as an example. Adam says in the book later that to walk with God, to be a follower of Christ is to be a servant. And one of the primary ways that we serve is to practice kindness towards others. You know, God's primary way of acting in the world is through people. And in our last service together, if you think back many weeks, uh, when we were actually together in our last service together, um, we had a couple that spoke about the United Methodist women and they used the lyrics from a contemporary Christian song. Um, but it says essentially, you know, I woke up angry. I looked around the world and I, and I shook my hands at God and I said, what are you going to do about this? And I saw people being abused and hungry and I got angry and I said, God, you need to do something about this. And his answer is I did. I sent you. And um, even now doing this, it gets me a little bit choked up when I think about that. But we were created for this. When you read Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, there's a book that was written entitled Why Good Things Happen to Good People. And they did a study on 137 people with multiple sclerosis. And some of the people that were in this study received support from a physician. And some of them actually received support telephone calls from other people that had multiple sclerosis. What they found at the end of the study is that five of the people that were in the support group that did the calling to other people with multiple sclerosis actually had improvement in their own symptoms. So you would giving others help and support actually had a benefit on the giver who did that. The Mayo Clinic did a study um, and found out that people that volunteer actually have decreased levels of depression, that those individuals were more mentally and physically fit. They described decreased stress levels. Maybe it's through giving that we actually get the abundant life that Jesus speaks about. You know, another study where sociolo sociologists followed about 2,000 people for five years um, to determine the drivers of happiness. 
And what they found is that those that rated themselves very happy volunteered about six times a month. Interesting. You know, Carnegie Mellon research also showed that people who are over 50 years old who volunteered had a lower blood pressure. So you see, it's not just a spiritual thing. It's also a physical thing. There are physical benefits to us for serving others. Serving others is good for you. And it's not just physically good for us, but it also changes our spirituality. It changes us. Um, and it may impact us even most when we're just not feeling generous or gracious and we serve in spite of that. You know, it's in serving other people that we become a little bit more like Christ. And oftentimes when we're not feeling that, that may be exactly what we need. You know, sometimes service there's a great deal of service. Um, sometimes it can involve giving up a great deal, um, selling all of your possessions and becoming a missionary. Sometimes it involves giving up your life. But usually the way that we can serve is just lived out in small ways on a daily basis. Adam Hamilton describes the story of Kevin Hines. I mean, he's one of the few people that jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And he contemplated this and finally decided to end his life. He drove to the Golden Gate Bridge and he parked. He was still not feeling exactly certain about what he wanted to do. And he told himself that as he walked out on the bridge, if one person looked at him or smiled at him, he wouldn't jump. And he walked across the bridge and passed several individuals. No one looked, no one smiled, no one offered a kind word. And so when he got to the middle of the bridge, he jumped. And he describes that as soon as I jumped, that I, I knew that I had made the wrong decision. And he survived. But it only would have taken one individual to look at him to make a profound impact in his life. You know, most of the opportunities that we have to serve and to show kindness, they're unplanned. They're just interruptions. Um, and part of what is necessary to serve Christ is our willingness to be interrupted. So we see this even in the Good Samaritan parable. Um, you know, the Good Samaritan parable, there's, there's two individuals that, that are walking on the road. They pass a gentleman, both of them separate times, but both of them pass by. They don't stop. And then the Samaritan comes along and the Samaritan stops. Um, he clearly was on his way to somewhere, but there was an interruption and he stopped and he cared. And he actually took it a further step uh, and took the patient and took the person, put them into an inn, told the innkeeper, whatever, whatever expenses, I'll pay for them when I come back. But please take care of this man for me. Not just the interruption, but actually embracing the interruption and taking it even a step further. You know, clearly love wasn't a feeling, but it was the willingness to be interrupted. It was the willingness to take a risk. It was the willingness to give up comfort. It was the willingness to be late. And it was the willingness to sacrifice something for someone else. You know, this is what love and kindness really looks like. You know, there were times during Jesus' ministry where things were planned, but the majority of what he did was interruptions. If you think about many of the stories we see, he was moving from one place to the other and was interrupted by individuals or had individuals that, um, that, that wanted to grab his cloak or just touch him. Um, much of his work was interruptions and, and he made allowances for that. You know, as we do this and we allow those interruptions, we've talked before about how um, the right hand you consider being like a fist. And those are the things that we do together. So as the church, we do really powerful things together. We serve other people. As individuals, that's what's on our left hand. Tell us that you want to extend five acts of kindness a week. Um, so just five acts a week. It can be simple stuff. Uh, it could be, could be checking in on a neighbor especially right now while we have um, COVID-19 still going on. It could be picking up some extra groceries, maybe getting somebody some toilet paper if they don't have any. Um, it could be paying for someone's food. It could be simply telling the person at the counter that you appreciate them. 
you know, Adam tells a story in this where he was walking into a convenience store and the person that was checking out people were just clearly not having a good day. Very short, very, very frustrated. I mean, he walked up and she just sort of said, what do you, what do you want? And he said, you know what? Um, I really like your glasses. Where did you get those? She sort of looked up and she was like, you know, I got them from Target. And he was like, yeah, I really like those. I'll have to remember that. Um, and, you know, that's, I appreciate that. And he said, you know what? I just want to thank you for being here and taking care of all of us that come through. And he said, as he, as he continues to talk to her, her eyes well up with tears. And she said, that's the first time anyone has told me that they appreciate me being here. And so he, he purchases his stuff and he starts to walk away. And of course, when he gets to the door, he sort of pauses just a little bit and he hears the way that she talks to the next person and it's a kinder and it's softer and it's nicer. And so if you think about it though, telling her that one thing, how many more people does she come in contact with that day that makes such a big impact? Now we even see this from the cross. And when we talk about service, one of the biggest things that we can think of and probably the biggest act of service is giving up your life for your friends. Jesus says this. We see it from the cross. We see some of the things that Jesus says from the cross. And, um, but specifically, when we talk about the things from the cross that are impactful here, it's the comments and how Jesus spoke to Mary and John. So I want to pause here for just a moment and change uh, screens. I want to show you the video and then we'll come back. So, so we talk about worship and prayer, we talk about study and scripture, but we move from there to serving. And as I think about serving, you know, the entirety of the crucifixion was Jesus serving, right? So he says, just before his death, he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And how would he serve? By giving his life as a ransom for many. You remember the disciples are arguing that just before Jesus' death, which one of us is the greatest? They don't realize that he's about to be crucified. Which one gets to sit on his right hand and on his left hand when he comes into his kingdom? And Jesus says, it's not that way with you. The kings of the, of the Gentiles, they lord it over other people. But for you, if you're gonna really walk with me, it means you're gonna serve each other. If we're going to walk with Jesus, then we're going to have to pray, know the scriptures, and we're going to serve, which is what Jesus did as he's hanging on the cross. But I love this. There's a, there's a glimpse of how Jesus does this that's really, you know, we've talked about the five things that we do and how the ring finger represents the people closest to us. So on the cross, one of the seven last statements of Jesus is he looks down at his mother, and then he looks at his disciple, John, and he says, John, take care of her. The literal words are, behold your mother and behold your son. I love this, this small little act tells us that Jesus was not thinking of himself even as he was dying, but he was thinking about his mother and who's gonna take care of her when I'm gone. And so we talk about giving and, and of course our giving is in response to God's giving. God's given us everything. Everything I have is because of God. As you know, we're just showing portions of that video as we go through these series, and we will finish that video soon. Um, but it's so interesting here that one of those last words and the words that Adam sees where he sees the service so much is taking care of his mother. You know, it's Mother's Day coming up on, uh, on Sunday. And depending on when you're watching this, it's coming up on this Sunday. But this is also really timely as we're going through this. You know, Jesus reminds us here that kindness and service includes your parents. So much that it's actually the fifth commandment. But we also want you to remember as we go through this that John wasn't Mary's son, um, but he was called to care for her as if she was. And we are called to care for others as, wish, as if they were our own parents as well. You know, he, as he wrote this book, I don't think that anyone had any idea the impacts that COVID-19 would have on our society several years ago. But he says, check on the elderly, call them, help them. Call those that don't have a family, check on them. And 
that probably couldn't be more appropriate than it is right now in this world of social distancing. You know, Jesus' death on the cross was a servant dying a death to redeem the entire world. But his words from the cross about his mother remind us that his care was not only just for the entire world, but it was also for his mother. And so I ask you, who is God calling you to care for as your own mother or your own father in service? I'm glad that you joined me this week uh, for this lesson. Um, and I hope that you continue to come back. We've got two more weeks. Um, luckily, all of these are recorded. So if you're if you are got some extra time, you can skip Netflix and you can binge watch The Walk um, as we go through these series. But let's pray together as we close. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the days that you have given us. Lord, We've all been impacted um, by this virus and it's changed many things in our entire world. But it's also given us an opportunity to serve others. Or well, there's many in our community that have needs. There's many in our community that need help. There's many people that we impact or we come across with every single day that just need a smile or just need an encouraging word. You know, there's Lord, there's people that need food. They need, they need other things and resources as well. But as we serve other people, we know that we're going to become a little bit more like you. Lord, we're called to service. We're called to live our lives in a way that reflects you to other people. Lord, I just pray that we yield ourselves to you, that you would speak to us, we'd be able to hear you, we'd be able to see those opportunities that we have every single day. Lord, just lead us down that path, walk with us, support us, love us. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you.